in the mid 80s, uh, uh, we had the movie Wall Street and the, and the key line was greed is good. Well, uh, that uh, has become kind of passe now. And now we're back to a situation, let's work together, let's do uh, what's right for, for all of us and help each other. It uh, is one of the big secrets, uh, I think, in American business. To me, the fact that we are not driven simply by profit gives us a great amount of freedom to do things differently. The United States at night from space. Millions of lights marking a country thought to be built by capitalists. But a third of those lights are actually lit by a different business model. Well, you know, from the management point of view, the cooperative model is a tremendous advantage because everyone feels like it's their business. The whole concept of a cooperative is to provide a service or a good to the members of the cooperative at cost. Because cooperatives started in sort of this rural desperate need uh, to get services to people in communities that otherwise would not have water, electrical, or telecommunications. But, but it's evolved so much more beyond that. In the Depression era of the 30s, one of the services that could not be gotten any other way in some parts of the country was electricity. The government helped cooperatives form to bring power to farmers in rural areas. They certainly needed electricity. Uh, it is what modernized uh, modern agriculture in this country uh, was uh, the ability to get electric service to the rural areas. Floyd Robb works for a co-op that provides over six gigawatts of power to 124 distribution co-ops that serve over 2.5 million members in nine states from Canada to the Mexican border. An impressive feat because those members are scattered over an area twice the size of Spain. That if you look at a satellite picture of the United States at night, it's that big area that doesn't have a lot of lights in it. <laughs> That's the area we serve. Basin Electric produces power from a variety of sources, including renewable energy, and is looking for ways to burn coal cleaner. We have put money on the line that says if you can come in and prove your technology and show us that we can economically remove CO2 uh, from a conventional power plant, we want to see it and we want to help make sure that it gets developed. Basin Electric already captures carbon dioxide from their natural gas operations. The greenhouse gas is sent north to Canada and is pumped underground to boost oil field production there, thus staying out of the atmosphere. Because the bottom line is, is that our mission is to provide electricity to our members at the lowest possible cost, but being environmentally responsible at the same time. So that's always a balance. Besides bringing power to farmers, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal created better housing. Originally, the idea was to provide decent housing for low-income families. They had to be working, they had to have jobs, um, and the idea was to get them out of the city and into a place where they could have um, basic, basically a healthy environment. And so the government built this city. In a sense, this was a social experiment. People were picked, they had um, you know, a mix of people of different socioeconomic income levels, and the idea was to build a community, and it still is today. And when the government got out of the housing business in 1952, the residents formed a cooperative and bought the complex. I own one sixteen hundredth of this organization because I'm a co-op. Barbara Havkost came to the community as a 19-year-old college student. Married a college student, found that the uh, J.H.I. homes were nicer and cheaper than student housing at the University of Maryland campus and moved here. And I've been here ever since. Surrounded by some of the most expensive housing stock on the East Coast, the co-op's 1,600 homes in the center of Greenbelt, Maryland remain affordable with attractive benefits. I like the idea of being able to call J.H.I. and say, the toilet doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> the sink is leaking. Uh, this plaster wall needs replastering. It gives people an opportunity to have affordable housing without having to worry about the big expenses. And members sell their homes on the open market. This is a walking community. Uh, and because we do live close and we, we share common areas, people do get to know their neighbors. In housing cooperatives, people have in their hands the tools to fashion their own destiny.
Most newlyweds believe a home is part of their destiny, but good finances are essential. I always figured, oh, I'll go to college, I'll graduate, and I'll be rich, and I'll pay off all my credit cards. But it really doesn't work that way. We sat down with our coach and realized, wow, you know, we, we really, we're negative. You know, our, our net worth is negative. We, you know, we actually owe more than we can possibly have in our bank or anywhere else. We sell off all our assets or whatever, and we still wouldn't have any money. One of our goals has been to increase our net worth, and we've already been successful in doing so, you know, thanks to all of our coaching. Um, Newlyweds Sean and Candace Gerke are being coached by the GECU, a cooperative credit union serving the people of El Paso, Texas. Financial issues are a major cause of divorce in newlyweds. It's a major issue. If we can help newlyweds come together in their finances before they start on their life together, then we've helped. We've made a difference. Uh, we were formed in 1932 by 11 guys with $5 a piece. And their whole goal was to help their co-workers stay away from loan sharks. We're still fighting to teach our members how to save and how to stay away from today's word for loan sharks being payday lenders. The credit union has 267,000 members and assets of $1.2 billion that it uses to make loans to its members. If the loan is coming from some entity in California, the payments are going to California. When my member's making a payment, it's coming back to El Paso. And what do we do? We put it out in loans. It all circulates right here. And we make our decisions here. If we can help the people in El Paso to lift themselves one dollar at a time, five dollars at a time, then we help our whole community. And I think that's the difference between a cooperative financial institution and a for-profit financial institution. We're here for one thing and one thing only, our members. Come on, girls. Come on. Cabot Creamery started in 1919 where farmers in Cabot, Vermont, unified with $5 per head and a quart of wood to start the creamery for some place to put their milk. They had no market for their milk and by unifying they could together make butter and get it to Boston. They actually used schooners to get product to New York. Great, great beginning. And it continues today. Cabot uses only about a third of their milk. Uh, in fact, we are the largest supplier to manufacturers throughout the Northeast for both fluid milk sold in jugs that you see in the grocery store, as well as some ice cream and yogurt companies. And, but the beauty is that by having the brass to own the brand, in fact, we own two brands, both Cabot and Macadam, and those brands are the hedge against the volatility of the milk market. It means that every extra penny we make selling Cabot cheddar or yogurt or cottage cheese or butter is uh, some penny back in their pocket. Uh, they get paid for their milk, but then at the end of the year, they get that 25th check on the profits shared by to each of the farm families. Cabot's cooperative business model has helped keep family farms operating in the Northeast. Out here in the independent West, it's not as popular and as uh, understood a business model as it would be in some of the other parts of the country where people just consider it commonplace. Nancy Cassidy is the general manager of the Ocean Beach Organic People's Food Co-op. It started 35 years ago in a garage, moved into a billiard parlor, and now is in an award-winning, environmentally friendly building. So yes, the, dis the sustainable design of the building included uh, no chemicals in the paint and using floor coverings that are benign, siding the building so we take advantage of the sunlight and the breezes as well as the solar cells upstairs and recycling all the materials that we took out of the old building. And that was part of the mission that we have to live in a way that does not make a net deficit for future generations. Our business is now doing about ten and a half million dollars and we have 8,000 families that own us. We employ a hundred plus people, we offer paid vacations, you can make a great living here. So it is an economic alternative to the going it alone and, you know, the bottom, the, the single bottom line, the profit bottom line above all else. Just over a thousand miles north of San Diego, the profit only bottom line is not part of the diagnosis for one health care provider. 
Group Health is a not-for-profit cooperative that's been part of the Seattle healthcare scene for 60 years. We're not obsessed with profit. We're a non-profit organization. And every penny that we make uh, above our operating expenses goes directly back into the organization. And it's back to apply to our patients to make their health care experience the best it can be. For instance, investing money in a secure web-based record system that lets their 574,000 members keep track of their care and get their prescriptions electronically 24-7. And Group Health has hired specialists to handle the paperwork, so the co-op's 877 doctors don't have to. She had to prescribe a certain drug, and it was a lot of paperwork. And in her old practice, it would have taken her all day to clear all the hurdles. Here it was one call, and it's put in motion all the players to get this done for her. So we maximized her time. And as a co-op, the members receiving care participate in how the place is run. And our job, as I see it, is to support the center uh, and to come up with ideas that might be helpful to them, but also coming the other way, we get information uh, from the manager. I believe that group health is better because we participate, we know what's going on, and we get the very best of medical care. And they either do it them, themselves or they provide it and see that, see that it's done. Group Health promotes healthy living outside their two hospitals and 25 primary care centers by sponsoring biking events in the Seattle area. The Spin Cycle Bike Shop is a standalone retail business. It gets cooperative when it comes to some goods and services. North Carolina native Kevin Coggins opened Spin Cycle in 1992 after trying to buy a bike for his wife on their second wedding anniversary. I went in almost every bicycle store in the area and said, I've got $1,000 in my pocket, I'm ready to buy a bike for my wife. And, like, people ignored us. And we were going, there's got, there's got to be a better way. And Coggins found the better way to succeed as a small, independent Main Street business in a global economy was to join a purchasing cooperative called Yaya Bike. Yaya Bike does not buy inventory and warehouse inventory to sell. What they do is they work with suppliers and say, we've got 300 store locations that will buy your product if you'll sign on with us. And so distributors and manufacturers sign on directly with Yaya Bike and then they have an, a captive audience of 300 potential customers almost immediately. Uh, Yaya Bike is is very uh, is a different co-op. Uh, some some uh, some co-ops, the members fully integrate the co-op into their business. Uh, Yaya Bike, all the businesses continue to be completely independent and call on the co-op as needed. While the cooperative business model is only a small part of the spin cycle story, equal exchanges business is all about cooperatives. Part of what makes us unique is, is although we're a worker cooperative and we're owned and controlled by the workers, the mission that our members have set out is very broad and actually has to do with changing the way that the food system works. So we're purchasing our products from farmer cooperatives around the world. We're processing and packaging them here as a, mark, as, as a worker cooperative and then we are selling them largely to consumer co-ops. So all along this chain, you've got people owning and controlling their own businesses through a cooperative means. In 1994, there were about 10 employees. Coffee roasting was contracted out, and sales were barely $700,000 a year. Now, there are over 100 employee owners, and Equal Exchange sold $23 million worth of fair trade products last year. Uh, to us, what fair trade is all about is making sure that all the people in that chain are treated fairly, um, that have some control over their lives, that uh, are able to make a living. We feel good the eight co-ops profiled here represent just a few of the many cooperative business model variations that exist in the United States today. There are thousands of others that are hiding in plain sight and succeeding financially to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. We're a major force. There are over 40,000 uh, cooperatives in this nation and you got over 120 million members. Uh, that's a lot of people. Uh, you're talking about one way or another, nearly a third of the United States, the population of the United States. 
uh, a force to be reckoned with uh, when we decide to come together. People losing pensions, people, you know, lives being destroyed by inappropriate corporate behavior. You don't see that happening in the co-op system because that accountability is real. The people are at the top of the table of organization. And if they don't like the way something goes, they can elect a different board, and I've seen it happen here several times. All the money that the cooperative makes stays with, with the members. And business school tends to look at it almost on this profit and loss basis, and in fact, our triple bottom line, if you will, also has a social agenda, an ethical agenda. Cooperatives are the better business model. They should be the first thing studied in business school. I think for-profit is very important to our nation, but I also think self-help is very important to our nation as well. We have to have a good balance. When you see a tattooed kid these days, it's really an expression of internationalism more than anything else. And I have a great deal of uh, hope in that uh, phenomena because I think out of that kids do see that we all are in it together and that working together we can do better. We have a lot of young people involved in this organization and I, I think it's, it's largely their energy which helped, has helped us be as successful as we are. They take very seriously the cooperative principles, they take very seriously that this is a democracy and they are here to make that work. And the thing that excited me about resigning from Congress actually to come to take this position is the, the fact that you be part of a movement. Uh, while money is important and certainly the self-gratification that comes from, uh, from money uh, uh, is uh, very appealing to a lot of people, uh, the real satisfaction is going to uh, be working with, in something that you believe in, something that you enjoy, something that you can commit yourself to. And, uh, and that's a movement. And the cooperative program is a movement, not just a business, but a movement. We are a global economy, and a global economy relates to people and their needs. And it is no longer a matter of which company, it should be which cooperative. And how are you getting the best for yourself, for your family, and you do so through the cooperative structure. Mm -hmm.